Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take a walk around various topics that tend to cross one's path. When you go on this adventure of communicating with images, we think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Dross. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... Hey, Jersey. I am Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer, game designer, and I also coach collaboration. How are you doing, Jersey? I'm doing okay. Um... You know, we, we, we pick a topic every week and try to drill down on it as, as, as thoughtfully as we can. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I was uh, thinking about maybe stepping back as far back as we can <laughs> on this adventure of communicating with images and, like, ask ourselves, just do a quick check-in, why are we doing what we're doing? Why do this stuff at all? And how does our motivation change and evolve and accrue new motivations over time. Um, I think this will be a fun philosophical episode to dig into a little bit. Um, what do you think? I think so. There might be some functional utility to this as well, uh, because I, I, as, as scary and, um, and uh, I don't know, uncomfortable as examining one's own motivations and coming up with that, that essential why you're doing that thing. Hmm, I, it, it, that's, it, it may be a useful building block too. So. Yeah. I, I think maybe. in the second half, we'll have some really good rationale for like the, the, the utility of doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, cause I know, I know you and I have spent, well, pretty close to a decade doing this project and, having lots of check-ins between recordings going like, okay, well, what are we, what, why are we doing it this way and not that way? What, what, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and, and having conversations about like, well, we, part of this is we're doing it because we like to do it. But anyway, so uh, speaking of liking to do it, let's just dive in and do it and talk about in the first part. <laughs> the music indicates that we're in the first part of the show where we talk about what it looks like. And so, well, what does why look like? Well, that I, I guess I would say this is more like just examining for ourselves, modeling the question of why do we do things? Why do we make the art that we make? And maybe by talking about it together, we can model this, this investigation for other people and then in the second half, go into the rationale. So <laughs> this topic was inspired for me by, I was listening to uh, Brandon Dayton's How to Be an Artist podcast. Have you listened to the show yet, Rob? I have, I need to, I have not yet. Um, but, uh, how, how did this, uh, how did Brandon's podcast affect you? He's been a guest on the show a few times too, and he's a supporter as well. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, it, it's funny. I guess it aside, like whatever, like somebody asked this question, I feel like in our current, well, not in the current climate, but like, I, I would say in recent history to ask, have you checked this out yet? There's implicitly, because if you haven't, what's wrong with you? <laughs> And I would like to say that the, the subharmonic when I ask that question is that like, hey, look, I know we've got a zillion things in the universe to consume and in interact with. So if you haven't heard of this thing, I understand it. But I want to preface this by saying that to understand whether or not you've heard of it so that I'm not explaining or jersey explaining something to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, you, you, you come across as, um, as, I mean, having something, you know, it, exciting like if something affects you it's a it's a resource it's great to share that and a lot of times we tune into each other in in all these different experiences and podcasts to, to hear that sort of curative voice and be like well, I'm always looking for that next interesting thing too so so you found that this I'm it, it makes a lot of sense that Brandon would make an interesting podcast, but I'm yeah. curious. Um, so yeah. how, how did it, how did it affect you? So What's episode up? three, first of all, like full disclosure, I was in episode one. So if you want to hear me have like a really like, uh, like I, I would say vulnerable conversation with Brandon that there's a tease to go check it out. But, um, Episode three, he talks with Cole Glass, another, uh, artist that I admire, uh, filmmaker. And it, he talked, Cole talks about like the parts, the process that are very difficult, um, and like, like in any art, there's going to be some kind of grind part of it, right? There's going to be parts where you encounter either some friction in like, it's either skill acquisition, you're leveling up and maybe you don't know how you to do what you want to do, or it's some kind of tedium 
There's like, there's tedious parts to making anything. Uh, and he, oh, and he said those parts are hard and it's difficult to get through emotionally. But then he also talked about this moment where he was submitting a film to a film festival where he worked like really hard to edit it in time, get it to the deadline, fill out the form, pay the entry fee. And then he, and he hit submit and he heard himself, his inner voice say, well, I'm probably not going to get in. And then he had the presence of mind to say, whoa, wait a second. Then why did you go through all this trouble? Why did you go through all of this? And you paid money and you went through all this difficulty to like to do this thing only to say that you're probably not going to like get anything out of it. And he's like, in moments like that, he has learned, he's taught himself to like have a, like a quick little reminder that remember the reason you started to do this in the first place. Like when we get attracted to creative arts, um, like in, in the case he talks about, he's like, like you, you started doing this thing because you just loved doing it, right? Like when I started drawing as a kid, it wasn't like I'm drawing so that I can build my skills and then to engage in trade and become a professional artist someday. It's like, no, I just love drawing all the time. You know, it's like, there's the way I, I expressed myself. Um, and so like, that was the first like, yeah, you know what? That kind of check in with yourself is something I think is like a healthy thing to do. Uh, and then at, around the same time, I'm rewatching Avatar The Last Airbender one of the greatest cartoon series ever made. And one of the greatest cartoon characters ever written is Uncle Iroh. And I got this episode where like Zuko's going through his journey and Uncle Iroh like yells at him for the first time. Like he's been so kind to him the whole series. And finally he's like, Zuko, it's like, you know, I think it's time for you to deal with the big questions. Who are you and what do you want? You know? Uh, and I was like, wow, would that we all had an Uncle Iroh <laughs> in our lives? <laughs> <laughs> so I got these signals from the universe basically saying to me like, hey, it, it might be timely to talk about like asking yourself why you do what you do uh, and what do you want out of it in the first place? So, I mean, so let's look at some of our motivations. Um, I wonder what you, how you respond to Cole's story that I paraphrased and probably butchered quite a bit. <laughs> uh, let's see. I mean, there's there, there a lot of interesting elements there. And so Cole having the, um, uh, like, like where do I find a mean, meaning in, in all these different things? It has grown and changed over time. And as far as why I do it is because I find it meaningful. Um, I am, I tend to find a way to find meaning pretty easily because I can be, I've, I've worked, you know, plenty of jobs and things that I've um, had different, you know, challenges with and, and uh, disagreements, difficulties and what have you. But like the ones that, that I can, uh, that I've stuck around, I think I've grown through most is, is if I've found a, a, well, a framing like, well, why am I doing this? Is, is there some reason to be here that I can make, make a difference? And, and that that's with my own art. It's, uh, it's, it's like, well, I'm, I'm doing this to, um, to, grow as a human being because the, along the path of growth, I'm, I'm, I am feeling that I'm being rewarded and I'm able to share those rewards and then participate in this, this kind of exchange of, well, if, if, you know, this, these, what I've created, you know, meets an audience, like that reaction is, is a, is a big part of it too. And how we participate together based on that reaction. Is it um, so like, like I'm doing it for um, uh, belief and love and money and, and uh, friendship and camaraderie and all kinds of things. And it's like, I've collected tons of reasons over the years, but if I go all the way back to when I was like five, probably four or five years old and, and drawing and uh, you know, really finding a lot of love of drawing uh, um, both Snoopy and Snoopy related characters and rockets and um. I did it because I was reacting to a thing and it felt good to connect with those, that creative energy. And then pretty quickly after that, um, people around me recognized it. And that's pretty intertwined. Right. And yeah. so I, it's like this act of creating a thing as, you know, visual expression and what have you, um, that later on became more uh, you know, a pile of different um, tools and mechanisms to to do expression. But starting there, it was like, yeah, express and share that thing, get the reaction, 
and keep going, right? Yeah, you're but, um, you're absolutely right that like it, I think a common story a lot of artists tell, not all, but a lot is at some point in their childhood they express a zeal for doing the thing and then there's a moment where the other kids in the classroom or the teacher notice that there's something in there, right? I I think that that, that feedback is an important signal to get in order to stay motivated to do it. Um and and I think that that's it's worth circling that because I, I I think this is something where there's been I have encountered this discussion with artists of different stripes over the years where it's like well I didn't do it for anybody else I did it for me I'm like well did you uh, because like I I find it difficult to un- untangle those two things um, like I will say loud and clear that part of the reason I do it is because I want validation from peers, other, other artists I respect, people I admire, um, especially people I admire. Like the story that I, I I love telling is like when I met Dan Mishkin for the first time in 2006. And like, I was on pins and needles because like his work had a profound influence on who I became as a person. Like his characters and his stories were very much, they weren't just entertainments to me, they were guides for like how to think about the world. And so when I got to finally meet him and give him my comics, I'm like, it felt, to to him it was like an everyday thing, this happens to him all the time, but to me it was a momentous moment. Like this is a moment where I'm transmitting back to the person who helped 10 year old, 12 year old me, you know? And he came back to my table. He's like, oh, I read your books. And I'm like, oh, my God, he read my books. And he's like, yeah, your lettering's not awesome. <laughs> and it was like Jenga Tower down. <laughs> so, like, yeah, what was that about? That was me wanting recognition from people that I admire in the industry, people who I, I wanted that feedback loop to be the one that I've, I had when I was a child when the teacher says, great job, you know? And, and, and to be fair, he was, he was doing me a great service that day. It, it, it sucked in the moment, but like he really helped me be a lot more attentive to how I do sound in comics. And that's why there's several episodes of Lean Into Art where I go on and on and on about sound design. You know, it's because like this man gave me a push in the right direction. Um, and maybe there's like a lot of like emotional entanglement from that experience as well. Who knows? But that, that's, that's for a therapist to sort out. But um, yeah, I mean, guaranteed part of the reason why you're doing this there, you could probably get more insights by um, having conversations that that explore and unpack your experience, yeah. and uh, and how you're feeling and relating to it right now. That um, yeah, therapists are pretty great at that. <laughs> yeah. So, so are there, I I wonder if there's any other validations that I missed, like from peers, from people I admire, from the public in general. Um, to me, it's if let's see. So why why you're doing a thing? I think can become it, it, it a, um, a whole language of motivation and internetworked elements that um, have feedback loops on feedback loops, right? Where the s- s- feeling a reason to try is a great start, but then then you may not not all the feedback may work in a way that that's reinforcing it. Some may say that this is working or this not, this isn't working. When Dan Mishkin provided you that feedback, you found some reason to continue, even though it, there was some, <laughs> some sort of negativity there where then part of the motivation as far as why you do it must also be to improve at the thing. Like improving is its own reward. Yeah. So I guess why is it, is it all that we, you know, is, is everything like positive, you know, reinforcement psychology that um yeah. and it's part of it uh but like the getting better at it while continuing to get reactions while continuing to learn more from those reactions from the your internal ones and external ones because you could be making art that you don't quite find the connection with and and that that can be in, internally dampening where you're like eh, i don't know if i like this topic or this style or what is this mm-hmm. it's like i see i could improve at it but i, I don't want to improve at it i want to improve at something else okay so now that's internal um feedback and why and all that um yeah hmm. 
Yeah, achieving mastery. I mean, like it's it's it feels very analogous to when you're playing a game that is like designed in such a way to make it just difficult enough that it's frustrating, and then when you level up and you beat the mini boss, and it feels amazing, right? Um, that games have our our way to systematize, especially interactive games. Um, but but all all games, board games, digital, what have you, they. They create us. Um, I mean, they create some feedback loops that, depending on how you're motivated and how you engage with the themes around the feedback loops. I mean, that's it's a way to um, to look at that system of of like, well, why do we do a thing? Well, mm -hmm. we yeah. find purpose and reward and meaning. Or um, we talked about um, what self. Um, uh, oh, it's like a executive function kind of theory and it's it, it involves a uh, competency autonomy and re relatedness right mm. that's part that could be part of the why too because if you're not feeling effective you're not make, if it doesn't make sense to you what have you that becomes noise you don't tend to tune into that you gravitate away so what why are you gravitating toward it mm. yeah yeah um so yes, uh, th this is also uh, in intrinsic and extrinsic motivations is something that we've explored on the show before too. Like you know, mm. like there's there's motivation that comes from like there's a why that comes from you, and there's a why that's informed by the the contact with the ground. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I'm wondering if we could like just briefly talk a little bit about this whole idea of like engaging in trade. Because I, I, well, I think when I was in like third grade, second grade, whenever it was that I decided I wanted to be a creative person instead of something else, I, I want to say it was second grade. It's like when, like I didn't, I didn't necessarily know I wanted to be a comic book artist yet, but I knew I wanted to do something in the arts. Um, but like the idea of a job was so abstract, you know, like I don't have the context to understand what that means. It's just like, it's an identity that I can aim for somebody who does stuff that's entertaining and fun. Um, I didn't think of it, I, I'm pretty sure I did not think of it as a trade at that point. But by fourth grade, by fourth grade, I was actually drawing custom Smurfs for my classmates for nickels, right? Like they would actually, kids would give me a nickel and I would draw, like, I would like, tell me what kind of Smurf you want and then I would draw it for them. Um, so I was like making that money. That's fantastic. <laughs> is it? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're doing, uh, yeah, Smurf commissions. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> At like 11 it, years old, you, 10 years old. Wow. Um, so, but I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember what got me to that point. I don't remember the decision making process on that at all. I just have this vague, hazy memory of drawing Smurfs doing weird things for people. Um, like, mm. get, like get, do, do a Smurf whose specialty is jumping rope because that's like that is kids. It's like we're thinking about what are we, what are we doing all day, you know? And so, like, here's jump ropey Smurf. That'll be five cents, you know? Um, but so, like, something <laughs> happened where I realized like this is something that I can engage in some kind of trade in. I wouldn't have had the language for that back then. But, um, so, I mean, this is a motivation to do it, right? Like we also like at some point or another, we, we tangle with the idea of, can this be a sustainable thing? Is this going to be something that I do for purely, um, the other motivations of self, you know, mastery, getting respect from people, but then this, this third lane of, but can I also make it make money for me? Um, hmm. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, we've talked about, uh, like one way to evaluate projects and opportunities or our ways to pr make progress, like with a project within a project is to look at the, um, feasibility, viability, and desirability. And it's, these are different frames. The engaging in trade is, is looking at the, the viability. There's another idea that this reminds me of. It's a bigger topic, but I'll just point to it. Um, but, um. And I know that it's complicated when things get popular, excuse me for the disclaimer before I present the idea, things get popular for lots of different reasons. I still think there's, this is functionally useful. Uh, and it, so first it, it's, um, it's a concept. I think I've mentioned it recently, but I, I think you pronounce it Ikigai. And it's, um, it's, there's a, a, there was someone in, in Spain who wrote a paper and then someone in the U.S. that started, wrote articles and popularized it. But the idea is that there's a Japanese concept of uh, 
meaning, which is about your core meaning, like the reason you're here, like your core why, right? And it reminds me of a combination of both feasibility, viability, desirability as a, as a Venn diagram. And if you want to look it up, it's, it's I K I G A I. Right. Okay. Um, and it look at it as a, as a Venn diagram, these over, overlapping circles of that. But then if you throw in this other thing that, um, that we've talked about a few times, you coined the term, you, you call it my uh, creative coat of arms or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah where it's, I seek to do what I love for a community I care about using tools and methods I believe in to engage in a sustainable trade. Interesting criteria to evaluate potential paths forward opportunities. Like what do you want to gravitate toward? What, you, what do you want to go away from? Every bit of it, every, any single one of those words I've said in the last 30 seconds has um, piles of emotion and articles on medium that would say, watch out for an articles on medium that would say you must do, I don't care. Right. I think it's functional and that's why I share it. Um, so it all overlaps the engaging in trade part of the, the context for why were there nickels available? This is what pops in my head nowadays that wouldn't have popped in my head even like uh, 15 years ago. But like you think about you had a market for for custom Smurfs while you were age 10 because of your talent, because of the awareness of your ability. Right. Because mm -hmm. you're you're you wasn't quietly unknown. It was it was known and it was able to be acted upon. So like the there were funds in the market that were available for exchange. Yeah. Where were these nickels coming from is my question, right? <laughs> so like I had a, my hypothesis is that some, I bet like, like a, a little pint of milk or what have you, the little or a quarter milk, oh, I forget how much milk is, is in the, is in the school right. cafeteria, the normal purchase. But like you get, I, I'm guessing a, there was nickel for change for something, right? Ah, uh, yeah. And, um, yeah. And all of a sudden you've got the nickel, you've got a want for this recognized thing. It's a, anyway, so it takes all those things to engage in trade is why I mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, even if you're 10. <laughs> I think by fifth grade, I was actually selling transformers and He-Man drawings too. I remember drawing, uh, doing a drawing of He-Man running for a kid in my class. And I did a drawing of Megatron, like standing, uh, like just standing and looking powerful for another kid. Josh, I think his name was. Um, anyway, nice. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I, I wish, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, as I get farther away from that time, like these memories get so hazy and all I remember is like this, 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 this fleeting moment. And I, I wish I could go back and find out what was the conversation that got me to that point. Um, Cause like, was it, was it like Jersey being like a wheeler dealer? Like, yeah, you want a drawing? Five cents. Or was it they came up and they said like, wow, that's amazing. If I gave you five cents, would you do a drawing for me? And then I was like, oh, well, yes. You know, like how did that go? But anyway, it doesn't matter. Long time what, ago. How did the marketing aspect of that function? Like yeah. how did your the recognition of your capability get spread? Yeah. And yeah, but all those things are still at play, whether it's now and you're putting a, a book into the marketplace and uh or you know you're planning on tabling at conventions uh, someday when we can do that again and mm -hmm. whatever that that is um the engaging in trade has all those pieces to it which reminds which reminds me of that like my why is is layered right there's the there's a there is the inside and there is the outside and then there is like maybe an outer outside there's an ort cloud which, <laughs> it's, it's the Oort cloud of, of the Ikigai. guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 understanding these whys and like like checking in on them, I think we're going to talk in a few minutes about like why this can be useful. But it's like the moment we start introducing the idea of like engaging in trade, well, now we've created another feedback loop that can change the art. In that. We just talked about this a few episodes ago in the Maybe It's Time to Hire Yourself episode where it's like, okay, I made this thing. I thought that I had thought it through very carefully in terms of where it would fit in a market and developed it in a way that would make it an enticing thing to the people who I want to sell it to, and I didn't get bites. Now what? Right? Um, do I do it myself and prove it's prove the case so that I can attract buyers 
or do I move on to try another experiment based on the feedback I got from the market? Market being editors, right? Do I try mm-hmm. a different market? So, and why am I doing this thing in the first place? Right? What? What do mm-hmm. you? But the trade part, it takes it out of. It's not just your your internal why anymore. There's there's like which editors got have their extra, you know, milk money nickels, and are you talking to those editors or, you know, and even if you are, are they like, well, this nickels for you or this nickels for this other other thing, and you know, what do you want to take from that? Yeah. Well, you want to take a break and then talk about like the utility of asking why. Hmm. I sounds awesome. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, in about a minute and a half, we're going to come back and talk about like why it is useful to ask why. Before we do that, we want to thank some more some people who make this show possible. And those are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lena Tart is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in Rob and Jersey, what we work on here at Lena Tart, and you want to help it make it more sustainable, you can contribute as little as a dollar a month. And you can also cancel it at any time. You can do a one-time contribution, avail yourself of the stuff that's behind the scenes, and then, you know, check out and come back at a later date when you have some more discretionary income. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis. First up, Greg Horvath. Thank you, Greg, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Greg on Twitter at IGMHorv77. And Rachel Ross. Thank you, Rachel. Longtime supporter of the show. You can find Rachel on Twitter at NYC Terrace. You can see the latest uh, steampunk things that she's been sharing. Becca Hilburn is another person who's been supporting us for a long time. Thank you, Becca. You can find Becca on Twitter at Nato Soup. And India, amazing animator and artist. You can find India on Twitter at Old Swifty. And finally, Carrie Goble Billick. Thank you, Carrie, for supporting us for so long. You can find Carrie on Twitter at Mushin Girl. You can join them all at li- patreon.com slash lean into art where you will find all the shows we make as well as the extra leans the shows we record only for people who support us on patreon those posts become an open mic thread we can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners also get you access to the lean into art discord which we'll talk about a little bit later in the show patreon.com slash lean into art thank you to everybody who supports us there it means a lot to us thank you so much all right let's let's uh get some more music in here mm intense thinking hard why ask why this is, uh, this is when colombo has one more question <laughs> just one more thing uh all right so why why think about why so much um you know doing this kind of self analysis can sometimes feel like navel gazing right um mm-hmm. look i know who i am I did the work. I'm a grown up now. Don't pester me with this whole checking in on myself. What kind of woo woo stuff are you trying to sell me, Jersey and Rob? Um, <laughs> it, if, if they made it to episode 324, <laughs> they're not asking that question anymore. Maybe. Uh, I mean, we, we may have finally tripped someone's woo woo trigger. Who knows? And, uh, and and it's like oh I, I didn't expect this but here I am what what's up with you, uh, Jersey and Rob? Uh, you're asking me why again? Um, but man, this is which is reasonable. Like I mean, honestly, at that point of view, uh, it, I I coexist with it. I don't I don't find any like inherent. I don't want to pick um, a disagreement or or conflict with someone who isn't into it. Uh, and it's we're the country uh, where we ask why well we're the country where we don't ask why ah oh, let's hate yeah. each other <laughs> um i think you know sometimes um folks who who don't not want to ask why i mean it can be for so many different reasons it could be well because it could be very tactical could be strategic and lifelong or what have you and um you know that's uh, I would imagine also like maybe there isn't necessarily a need for the asking why, because there's so much baked into your current mechanism of lifestyle and professional stuff where you're just, you know, it's not necessary. So it might seem, I can totally accept that. That could be like, psh, that's weird. But like, as soon as you have a product that bombs, you know, it's like, okay, your ecosystem set up really good. Why did that happen? I don't know. 
Um, I, w- I would I would might... submit that in most lines of work, this is baked into like any system that is meaning to create either a product or an experience, right? As as a teacher, um, you know, I have to create lesson plans. I have to justify what what I'm going to do in the classroom, and I have to define objectives and outcomes. You know, like that's part of being a teacher is understanding how are the students going to be different after experiencing this thing? You know, I have to be explicit mm-hmm. about that. I remember when I was first starting teaching too, like this is way back in 2007, uh, the first time they had to like, when I was being instructed to make a lesson plan, like you need to establish the objective and the outcome. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You're asking me to tell you what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I really had a hard time wrapping my head around that. Like, no, no, no. It's intended outcome. <laughs> You're guessing at what some of the outcomes could be. And there's probably going to be more, you know? Like, like, I came at it like such a, such a uh, you know, like I was like, hey, man, <laughs> the future's going to happen. We don't have any control over. We're just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good, uh, good hippie. But, um, uh, but... So they weren't asking you for some hard metrics of like, well, what percent of these kids will become animators at Disney? Right, what right. percent will be animators at Netflix? And who will be making comics for? Right, yeah. right. Like that was the thing I had a hard time wrapping my head around. And I was like, oh, I'm just establishing that like this is the intent, this understanding, this um, being more conversant or more versatile or having a, a broader or deeper understanding of these core concepts will have happened as a result of engaging in this lesson, right? So, but then the objective, like, you know, what is the purpose of this activity? I had to be explicit about that. And, and to this day, I mean, I, I just created a lesson plan for a series of online classes I just did, uh, just wrapped up like a week ago. And, uh, that I had to establish the objectives. What are the objectives? What? How do we know so that we can tell the grant funders who are paying for this thing that their money was well spent? How do we know that whether or not it was successful? Um, you know, that, that this, this yeah. thing called success criteria. You know, it's it's a useful mechanism. It's it's that. Um, I think it implies that you want to keep doing this, right? It's not just a, like a one-time cavalier um, trying something out, right? Where that's, that can be fine too. So you could informally, you know, dabble into uh, whatever kind of creative endeavor. And, and if it's not, if, if you don't intend to do it again, I like, I guess why is, um, not as useful, right? But like, as soon as you're like, well, I want to be set up to do this and to keep, to, to continue. So then I need to be able to share the story of having done this and what it means to have been served in, in doing this, right? Where like, you're talking about the effect of your, you know, intended if outcomes for students. And then by having, you know, then perform those, those classes, then you, you have actual outcomes to then look at too. All that then continues to feed back into this ongoing story of you. Now, let's see, being able to include others in the why and having other stuff that you can point to that give credibility to your description of the why. Um, that yeah okay yeah we're talking about why is within why is within why is now because like one of the <laughs> one of the reasons one of the reasons I do that so I actually do I, I evaluate I do a self evaluation on how classes went and and I do check ins with myself throughout my courses to see how the students are engaging and reflecting on how the students are engaging or not um, and one of the reasons I do that is because a big why of why I do this is that I want to make this stuff accessible to children in a way that it wasn't accessible to me. So there's the whole Batman thing going on there. Um, the, but there's also, um, I want to create an experience for children where they understand, they have a, it, it's made very explicit to them and clear to them why this is important to know whether or not they want to go into this as a career. Um, because there's another experience that I had as a child where it's like teachers just didn't do a great job all the time of explaining to me why this is important to know. Like algebra was this abstract thing that they just want, you're doing it because I'm telling you to do it, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but it kind of sucks. Why are you asking me to like do this thing that sucks so bad all the time? Oh, because you're a grown up and you're pushing me around? Well, that doesn't make me feel great. <laughs> I don't feel like a, a ton of motivation to be here right now, you know? 
Um, and I'm like, okay, well, I want my, I want my students to feel super motivated and I don't want this to ever be boring to them. So I need this thing to be alive. I need this course to be a living, adaptable thing that meets them where they're most interested and most excited so that this always stays engaging for them. So I've got that hmm. motivation going on that makes me stop and ask why all the time. So that's an important, I guess, context to like my, my perspective on that's, this. Yeah. I would say you outlined um, a principle Yeah. that like, so a principle is, a, is something that you can choose as a, um, like a measure or constraint to influence um, everything about a project. Yeah. And to say that, well, okay, I, I'm doing this for, and so if you have a list of principles, they're providing a lot of insight as to the why you're doing this. Um, because they're, you're like codifying your beliefs about a thing and the how to go about it and the why and, and all that stuff. It's um, so to, you know, like to say that, well, you want your classes to be, well, you could say memorable or uh, accessible or um, to um, hmm, provide enough experience so, so people know how and where and why they would want to continue with the thing or I, I'm, I'm making stuff up, but you could have list the uh, principles about the stuff you make and then actually those, they can help. So as far as why, another why of why, um, describing the, your why as principles. Now it makes it a lot easier for others to, to um, well, uh, well, understand more about that thing, like that class. Oh, this is what this class kind of, it conveys more of a feel of what you, you can expect, but also if others are, are teaming up with you to make a thing, it's, it's actually very um, helpful. Well, to yeah. To hold yeah. the group to those principles. There's, there's even more layers to this as well, in the sense that, so what my classes at the art center, when I was teaching in Ann Arbor, like really started to take off and become like, there was like waiting lists for them. Uh, the art center turned to me like, okay, you're doing something that, you know, we want to tap into. Can you teach how you teach to our other teachers? They actually hired me to do a, a session on like professional development to like sort of teach my style to the other instructors. Now, if I didn't do that constant checking in and evaluating and looking at why I'm doing this and, and it, what are my success criteria, I wouldn't have had the language to get paid for that opportunity, right? I, I'm not saying that that, so like it's perfectly reasonable to, when you level up skills to the point where it becomes an intuition, right? So we were just talking about this off mic. I was talking about this in my class recently is like certain skills when you acquire them, it's like when you get on a bicycle and you just know what to do. You don't have to talk through the process of riding a bike. You don't have to say step one, put my hands here. Step two, put my feet there. This is how you correct. You just you just becomes an intuition because th there's a certain level of mastery that's happened. It's the same thing with drawing. Like there's certain things I don't think about when I draw them. I just do it, um, and it's that is a perfectly you you can go through life that way. You you can do that. You could just intuit uh, how to engage with every problem, and then when somebody asks you like, "What did you do there?" I don't know. <laughs> right and that's the old joke like this is an episode of home movies when like brendan small goes to Dwayne, the kid in the, the rock band he's like how do you how do you play guitar he's like like this and he goes nah, 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 you know and it's like well that's true there's a truth to that <laughs> that is how you do it <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah. laughs> so <clears throat> it's um that so you said something um let's see to, so you have the language and this is a like another really functional reason to be able to describe why you're doing what you're doing is so yeah there's the big picture there's your the narrative about your career and the progression of you know what you've done where you're going next and that that kind of stuff but there's just this give what given thing are you working on right now your product your service what have you and if you're able to describe your principles and beliefs and why why you're you're engaging in that thing and how does that make someone's, you know, life better or different? That's pretty useful language, just in the whole like life cycle of a product. Mm -hmm. um, 
you're going to want to talk about it. Like, so, so a product or service getting into the world, um, I've been framing things as, as, um, say, as, as a, a triplet of make and merchandise and market, right? Mm. And there's kind of a, I don't have a cool diagram for it yet, but like the, there's this, like having a why that it helps me in all, all three of those areas. It helps me focus as far as the, the scope of, of the making. It helps me um, know as far as where to reach out, as far as the marketing. And it helps me as far as the merchandising when the marketing is working. Um, what, how to describe it, like, like the naming the product, describing the product in, in, in terms of benefits and maybe some features, but most, you know, getting, getting that language. I thought that was a really... Um, yeah. That's an example of putting that language to use. Yeah, uh, it's something that a friend of mine is encountering in starting up a business, and I know you've had some experience with this, but I, I you know, you don't have to like chime in unless, unless you, you feel like it. But he's encountering the odd cognitive dissonance of hyper specificity and defining who your customer is. Right, like he's being, he's going through this 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 project, this course where they're like really saying like, no, no, narrow it down to like as is like these are people who eat gummy bears for breakfast and you know go to church on Tuesday nights, <laughs> right? Like, how many people can that be? A surprising amount. And when they when they hear about your service, they're gonna be very enthusiastic about it because it's as if you tailor made it for them, right? And having that language helps get you to that hyper specificity, right? Like, cause you could say, well, my comics, they're for everybody. I hope, right? Yes, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> but that doesn't, doesn't tell this specific person why they should necessarily pick it up and read it. Um, it's and and for a given project, that's where I have a chance. So you're mentioning something that I, I, I don't know if you're talking about me, honestly. No, I, I I literally talk about a different friend, and when they were telling me their you story, have a different friend. Oh my and, 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 and when, I, when they were telling me the story, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have heard this before. This, I, what you're going through, I know Rob went through this as well. Like that weird, it's a it's a it's an, a surprisingly challenging idea. Like, can you narrow it down to like a very very specific human being who you're making it for? Yeah. And that's, uh, and so I am continuing to pursue and refine the marketing and mess everything around my coaching service like that. I'm living that challenge still as far as the, the coaching stuff. And, um, and, uh, you know, that's, but like some products like guitar fretter, the game, I, I, I have lots of why for that. And it's really helpful and, and, and much more clear, I suppose, because it, as a scope of a thing of a creative, um, uh, artifact. It, it just has a lot more focus in it all throughout. Um, but, uh, but when something is, is as flexible as getting paid to have conversations with people to help them think through um, different roadblocks and problems and challenges, it's, it's honestly pretty widely applicable. And then it, then I have a heart. So I guess this is a barrier for like to, to just worth considering that for me, I get stuck in a why when I find I'm like, yeah, this is widely applicable. It really is. I have some experience and evidence and whatever the, that this, this is just darn useful. So yeah, it puts me in the, in the bucket of like, it's hard to say the why with enough specificity. I can talk about an, some why, but it's broad brush why. Yeah. And sometimes it really, it's, it's more functional and useful for a product or service if you can actually narrow that down. And um, for some products, I don't have a problem with that, but some others, it's, um, it's pretty tough. I should, I would totally like to talk off mic about um, what, and, and maybe connect with that friend you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's a friend I've recommended that you talk to before, so you know who I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I probably do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, is there anything else? Do we want to like save a little? Normally, we go in to talk about our two minute practice, but we're going to postpone that to next week, um, partially. And you know, I'll own it. It's because I just did not get a chance to even touch it this week, and I really want to engage with it to thoughtfully show up for the next two minute practice session. Um, so I, I appreciate you like giving me a little extra time, Rob. Um, it's no problem. I found like sometimes when we do like a two week 
uh, in between the practices, it's, um, it's helped me actually a lot. So um, I've only had a, you know, a couple of sessions so far and I would love to have more. Um, and it's, it's, we're pointing to the practice of um, I but basically picking up an instrument and making some noise with it for, yeah. for two minutes. If anybody else wants and, to play along. Uh, yeah. Yeah. By all means join in. And so, yeah, you can already check it out uh, either in the, the prior lean into art podcast or go to lean into art.com slash two minute practice. Number two. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, great. So um, how about we take one more break and then we'll conclude with, we'll go back to it like an old, old standard on the show, which was the final thought. It was the curveball for a <laughs> while. Good. Then it became final thought. Uh, a lot can happen with a project in nine years. Um, okay, so we got some more people to thank for making the show possible. And those people are us. We make the show possible. And we make lots of products and things that we hope you will engage with. We think hard about them when we make them, and we bring that thinking into this project called Lean Into Art. So odds are you might enjoy some of these things that we make. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is the 4 Million Years Later podcast. This is, yes, another podcast, and and I know, you know, there's a lot of podcasts to listen to, but here's the unique value proposition of 4 Million Years Later. It is me and my buddy Hoover, friend for 25 years, um, watching an episode of the Gen 1 Transformers cartoon in story order um, and convening to talk about what we saw, like reflecting upon it from what was our perspective as young people and as we engaged with this and has that perspective changed as we've uh, become adults and really doing a lot of serious story analysis, like evaluating what they're doing in the story that like really connected with us as children and, you know, being surprised by what connected with us as children. And then sort of like analyzing it to the point where we're like, well, what would have made this one even more amazing? Or what is uh, something that is really, was really invisible to us as children about this episode that now as adults, we're like, that's why it was so amazing. The, the episode that uh, the latest one this week is Auto Berserk, which is a story about uh, Red Alert, the uh, police, or rather the security chief of the Autobots, and uh, who is he's he's the security chief because he has like hypersensitivity, like he has like he has more sensors than any other Transformer, so he can detect when anything's happening around him. But as a result, he's a very nervous and skittish person. And then an accident happens one day, so his nervousness gets turned up to eleven, and then it becomes. And when I didn't pick up on this as a child, a story about anxiety. And how friends, and friends, uh, how somebody who has a lot of negative self talk, like a profound amount of negative self talk, can be led astray very easily. And and how friends have to step up for people like that, and how they have to rely on one uh, one another, and understand one another more deeply. And it's an action adventure story about betrayal and war and space guns, but it's also about this poor guy suffering from like really like uh overwhelming negative self-talk so that's at four million years later.com it's also in your favorite pod catchers everywhere um i did not pull up your store rob let me get that going right now well um yeah we can can check that out that's a that's a oh. quick way to um if you go to rob stenzinger.com slash store.html and you'll see all kinds of things that i make and uh one thing that i want to highlight is a game I make called Guitar Fretter. And um, so this. You want to pull it is, up on your screen? Yeah, I'll pull it up on my screen here. Let's switch to that. And uh, all right. So Guitar Fretter is a game all about um, it, it's like an action puzzle, how to um, you know, help you memorize the, the different note positions on a guitar fretboard. And it works for four or five string bass, six or seven, seven string electric guitar. And it's, um, uh, it's you, you'll see there's the simple matching that, that goes on where there's notes that are named on the fretboard. There's these creatures floating down. They'll take away your health if you let them hit all the way to the bottom. But then, um, oh, so I, since I hit this, uh, this note again, it actually is unlocking some health for me. And so the, my score goes up. The longer I do correct matches, I get a long streak. So it's the guitar fretter celebrates all kinds of things about just keep on trying and oops, I missed. Right. So I lost my, 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 uh, my bonus. Right. But there's still lots of ways to keep getting score. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pause this and, uh, uh, and, and quit and show you there's another, there's another mode 
um, and guitar fret or the guitar charts. You can pick any of the guitars that are in the normal mode, but here you don't have to have the stress of the creatures coming down. You can just sort of look at this and play around with it like a digital instrument. And, um, and that's, uh, you know, again, four or five string bass or six or seven string guitar. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Guitar Fretter has been around for like 10 years and I just did a huge update. Uh, I did a podcast about it too, because I thought it was going to take me four days to update and uh, add the new, add some new art that makes the, the um, just easier to see high contrast. And plus it makes it a full guitar, not a neck guitar, neck floating in space. Mm-hmm. And, you know, cause Guitar Fretter supports so many different shapes and sizes of screens. Well, then that, that took me a lot longer than four days, but I found it a meaningful, um, a meaningful journey and really in, in, in along the lines of the theme of like, well, why am I doing this project and what we talked about in this episode of Lean Into Art. Uh, I continued uh, working on this for four weeks and made it, uh, I think, the best version of Guitar Fretter that's ever, ever been around. And wow. um, really proud of it. Should uh, check it out. Go to uh, guitarfretter.com is a quick URL to um, bring you to a page that will get you to the Mac version, the Windows version, or Android, or iOS. Hey! Uh, hey! <laughs> so, there you go. Guitarfretter.com. All right. And the other thing that we hope you will check out is the Lean Into Art Discord. Lean Into Art has a forum now, and it's a way for you to interact with us directly. There are public channels where you can post some about your two-minute practices or to comment on past episodes, suggest future episodes. And then there's a special section for people who support us on Patreon where there's even a, a social channel where you just share things that are going on in your life. You can share work in progress with a brain trust of fellow leaners who will help you you know, navigate all these challenging and tricky things about making art so thanks everybody who's been hanging out in the lena tart discord oh by the way the invite link will be in the show notes for this episode and every episode whether you're watching it on youtube or watching it at lena tart.com or patreon.com slash lean into art so thanks to everybody who hangs out there with us it's it's been fun to interact with you in between shows yeah it really is it's a nice uh like low pressure uh community to uh just share some stuff yeah. Um, and, and like you said, it has that, if you're looking for that feedback loop, it's, that's there too. So, all right. Is there cool anything stuff. we didn't talk about that's on your mind about like this whole idea of like asking ourselves the big questions, why we're doing this? Um, I, I think it's, it's easy to get stuck on this topic and one way to just start to get, um, like, like my final thought would be um, asking yourself why about a particular project could be a good way to start and think about a couple of different columns uh, of, or, or ways to look at it. It's like, well, why are you, why are you doing this? Uh, why do you care about this thing? And um, why do you think others will benefit from it? So, you know, puts, get in your headspace, get in, you know, try to, you know, conceptualize, take, uh, you know, the perspective of others into account. And, um, and if it, if need be, you could get into other details, like why are you doing this in the way that you're doing this? And do these things point to sort of like a summarized why? And that could be just a, a handy foothold in, in, instead of, or, you know, just sort of asking why and staring off into space, but <laughs> that can work just as well. Yeah. And I would just reiterate this idea of like understanding what your success criteria is, is like a great way to know when to not throw bad, good effort after bad. Right. That, that's a big one mm. for me is like, I, I don't know. I'm really not awesome at being able to tell in the moment when it's time to disengage and quit something. Um, mm. And Understanding, like stepping back and be able to say, like, well, what are we really trying to accomplish here? Uh, it goes back to something I talked about in the uh, Art and Story podcast ages ago. Was I remember the moment I started to get a sense of like that writing was different than I thought it was. Was when I was trying to, I was working with my partner uh, Tom Root on a, some stuff for Antarctic Press, and I was throwing all these ideas out at him, and he, and he said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, okay, that's a lot of ideas. What, what's the story about?" And I was like, okay, well, as I understand it, the story's about this, this, and this. And he's like, okay, well, then these five ideas over here, do they have any business in there? And I was like, 
no, I guess not. You know, and like it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt to say that those needed to go away, right? Because I was like, oh, mm. he's pointing me to an external commitment rather than just indulging in my play fantasy. <laughs> so, God, I was I was all of the ripe old age of like twenty four at that point, <laughs> twenty five. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, yeah. So it's like like it's something that I have, I think as a sort of a natural habit nowadays to constantly do that, that, that checking in. But I just, I just also find it incredibly useful to do, to like understand what, what am, am I on, am I on track? It's a way to like get a, a map of where I am too, right? Like not like a, a clear map, but like at least a sense of direction and place. So. Uh, no, I, th I think that's spot on. It's incredibly useful to be able to, you know, put, get the language around, why you're doing what you're doing because that language lets you form a bunch of different mechanisms that could be uh look you know clarifying a goal and and or outcomes and then being able to look at that later on and say well how did this how was this fit and, and well met how how did this not work out and that's uh being able to, to describe the why gives um really hand helpful building blocks I think for I think all of that and uh yeah I think that's yeah, a great way so, to uh, yeah okay cool <laughs> I'm sorry I totally stepped on you there <laughs> no worries it's uh, yeah that's uh I just think that's uh uh it, it's seeing the I, you you pointing out the functionality of it too to um you know you you need to say uh to deprioritize some things to make what you want to make happen so it's it, that that was really functional and and, and uh, as helpful of your your friend, mm. and I know when I was in my in my twenties I had a, a lot a lot harder time with that because if it just felt right that was enough. Right, right, yeah, and 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 I I know in a lot of other creative people who they do everything out of a sense of intuition and they're like I just I just like feel it out. And I don't need to like put it all on a map the way you do, Jersey. I'm like, ah, but I think that's because you have a level of mastery that has become an intuition. And I don't think that necessarily intuition serves you every time. You know, I, I think that there are times when it might be helpful to step back. And uh, anyway, and we've talked about this a lot over the years, but I, I, it, was, it was nice and refreshing to come back and look at it as, uh, as its own topic. So thanks for this one, Rob. Well, thank you, Jersey. <clears throat> All right, we record this show live, usually, uh, every Thursday at uh, noon Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Central. We stream it live at uh, on the Lena Tart Discord. So if you want to watch it when it happens and interact with it, join the Discord. And then uh, we collect it as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanatort and leanatort.com. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanatort.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com, and I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.